1993 and work on the Castle Mall development in Norwich is nearing completion. In fact, some of the shops are to open very shortly. It's been a massive exercise in civil engineering and it's also been a massive exercise in archaeology, the biggest urban excavation in Europe. It all began at the end of 1987, with the archaeologists one step ahead of the developers, who were about to begin an enormous earth-moving operation to create Norwich's huge underground car park and shopping centre. The then Lord Mayor of Norwich, Councillor Gerald Wheatley, was accompanied by Mr David Bloomfield of the developers, estates in general, as he prepared to take out the first spadeful of earth from what was to become a spectacularly deep hole in the middle of the city. No one was more keenly interested in the prospects of the excavation than archaeologist Brian Ayres. Norwich is dominated by its Norman Cathedral and Castle. The underground car park and shopping development was destined to dig deep into the area south of the castle where the Bailey enclosure was located. This south Bailey of the castle had remained almost untouched by subsequent building since the Normans created it in the late 11th century. The film from the 30s shows the area in use as a livestock market and only a few air raid shelters were to be built on it during the Second World War. The cattle market goes back to the mid-18th century when landscaping work was done on the site to level off the defensive banks and ditches of the medieval castle. By then the castle had already presided over six centuries of Norwich's history. We know that it was besieged in the 13th century by a French force. The original short-lived version of the castle, started in 1068, had been built of wood. Before the Norman conquest, Norwich had been a Saxon town. As the evidence of churches and archaeological finds shows, concentrated on the river frontage near Firebridge today, where the commercial life of the town went on. Until the Castle Mall excavation, there was less evidence for Saxon occupation up on the higher ground. Although records suggest that to build their castle, the Normans pulled down Saxon property up there. This was where the Normans cleared a space for their castle grounds. In 1979, Brian Ayres had already found traces of the Saxons around here, and he had a lot to look forward to in late 1987. Behind me we have the site of Norwich Castle, not just the mound with the keep on it, but a great royal castle of some 14 acres, much of which now is now occupied by car park. Now that car park is designated for redevelopment, and it's the South Bailey that's being destroyed by this development. The South Bailey had ditches some 40 feet wide, 20 feet deep, if we believe 18th century sources. We know from Doomsday Book that in order to construct the castle, at least 98 houses were destroyed to make way for it, as well as a church and graveyard that we excavated in 1979 under Anglia Television's own headquarters. So the potential on this site, pending redevelopment, is really very great indeed. From the first, the site's potential was confirmed. Evidence for a massive ditch came to light in the first trial hole and archaeologist Jane Bowne was there to identify it. Here we are on the morning of day four and as dusk fell yesterday we got very excited because we thought we were already picking up the line of the rampart to the main ditch of the castle and in fact this would appear to be the line of that rampart um, which is very exciting so early on in the excavation. Until this excavation, archaeologists and historians could only speculate about the castle's original defences. Now they had the chance to find the real thing. The first trial hole, there were to be four of them before the main excavation, grew into a deep trench filled with the debris accumulated in the ditch for hundreds of years after it was first cut 
and before the landscape levelling of the 18th century. Here we are, last day on the excavation of this trial hole, this first trial hole, and what we've learned from it has um, been very instructive. The backfilling of this ditch, the post-medieval backfilling, is, has been very extensive. We're down six metres, and we, we haven't even reached medieval backfilling yet. We think there's at least another three metres, ten feet, to go until we get to the actual bottom. And we're not going to dig to the bottom in this hole. It's a very small hole, and it is a trial hole. The soil has been very compact and very similar all the way down. It's been full of domestic rubbish, people's thrown away broken pots, animal bone, leather shoes, bits of straps and buckles and that sort of thing. Um, and it's been very instructive for us for the huge range of material that we've got from this. We gave up using fines trays and we're using huge crates at one stage because it was coming out so quickly. Trial hole number one was abandoned and filled in temporarily to restore as much car park space as possible until the main excavations began. The scene of operations moved up towards Timber Hill for trial hole number two. Here too, evidence for ditches came to light and it began to look as though the system of banks and ditches around the castle would turn out to be more complicated than previously thought. There were the remains of air raid shelters to be dealt with too. After trial holes one and two with their medieval ditches, trial hole number three turned up evidence of the Anglo-Saxons in the form of that grey pottery known as Thetford type ware. This was evidence not just for Saxon occupation, but Saxon pottery kilns too. From trial hole number four, dug to complete the sampling of the site, the archaeologists didn't expect very much. They were in for a surprise. That's the most tangible piece of archaeology that we've come across so far, which is this great gatehouse, or what we believe is this great gatehouse. Um, it's built solidly of flint and mortar. We have two or three limestone coins surviving on the internal column, but the rest of the facing seems to have been stripped away um, sometime in the post-medieval period. Um, it's been damaged by the air raid shelters, obviously, because these come running through underneath my feet here. Um, we think it's of 13th century date, but the problem with it is at the moment, so we don't quite understand why we've got lots of post-medieval uh, pottery and clay pipe in soil that seems to be underneath the building itself. Now whether that's because uh, the buildings slipped down the hillside, perhaps into a Barbican ditch, we're still not too sure about and we hope to resolve that in the next couple of weeks. Jane Bound's surmise turned out to be correct. The original stone gateway had slipped, more likely been pushed, down into the ditch. Another casualty of that 18th century landscaping? The effect of the landscaping has been considerable. What we believe we now got on this area of the castle is essentially an upturned soup bowl. Most of the area behind us would have been a relatively high hill with deep ditches all around the exterior. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, the hill was scarped off at the top and the material dumped around the bottom. Now what we're going to do now is go away and assess what we've done for two reasons. Firstly, for the archaeological reason, look at the site as a whole and work out where we can put the major areas and how long each major area will take us to excavate given the various depths and the types of archaeology that we've recovered. The second thing to do is to tie that in with the developer's own program so that when we do excavate the site with them we can do it efficiently, economically and cooperatively so that we're all working closely together so that this project can be done as rapidly as possible. The trial holes had only been the beginning. The main excavation would feature 13 areas, 16 eventually, all over the extent of the development, starting with the block up by Timber Hill. The first phase of the main excavation took place furthest from the castle, at the south end of the South Bailey. And here, next to the area cleared by the Normans, evidence for their Saxon forerunners soon came up. 
there were Saxon graves, along with later medieval ones, in a graveyard belonging to a church that now turned out to have a Saxon foundation. It was all evidence for the presence of Saxons up here, away from their riverside concentration. If there were graves in a church, then there must have been houses too. Would these be found? And would higher estimates of the population of Saxon Norwich gain credibility? Perhaps as many as 10,000 people? In the same area, remains of medieval industry were discovered. A pit was excavated whose section, together with fragments of broken moulds found in it, show that this was a bell casting site. Molten metal was poured into a clay bell-shaped mould in a pit dug in the ground. High-tech at the time, like the total station theodolite used by the team of archaeologists to survey the site and measure in their finds, with data logger to record the readings on the spot. At the other end of the operation, another archaeologist with a prism for the infrared beam that pinpoints the features to be recorded. The data from recording devices like these could be relayed to the excavation headquarters on the site and used to build up the archaeologist's picture of their discoveries. By mid-1989, Brian Ayres had been joined by Jez Reeve as director of the day-to-day -day operations in the field. They had an enormous task ahead of them on such a large-scale excavation. So, uh, obviously, you've actually got the relationship between the two parts of the wall there. In order to excavate such a large site so rapidly, we've got to refine the excavation and recording techniques as much as possible. What we've got here is a new technique which has been pioneered in other urban centres of England called single-context planning. And perhaps Jez can um, describe what we're trying to do. Yeah, basically, uh, the usefulness of a natural pet drawing only one context on each sheet is that you can overlay uh, the plans, which as you can see are on a see-through piece of paper, on top of each other, so you can actually build up a picture of what's happening in the archaeology outside. We're also uh, able to transfer these uh, plans and also the written word onto the computer while we're actually on site and to keep uh, ongoing interpretation of what's actually happening. Now that the main excavation was underway, the site had been equipped with a visitor's centre and observation platform to keep the public informed about the archaeologists' work. On this part of the site, a coin was found of the Saxon king Athelstan, with the first mention of Norwich on it to be found on a coin minted in Norwich. And there was evidence of more banks and ditches from Norman times. The ditches could be clearly seen in the deep sections cut by the archaeologists. Darker infill of later material that built up over the centuries in the bottom of the ditches, until they were filled in completely by the landscaping process of the 18th century. All this new evidence of ditches threatened to modify the previous speculations of historians and archaeologists. This map was drawn about 1975, it represents the best available information they had at the time for the Historic Towns Atlas. And what they tried to do was to suggest where the castle ditches themselves run. And you can see what they've suggested is a Barbican ditch immediately to the north of St John Timber Hill, mm -hmm. and the line of the South Bailey Ditch being roughly on the alignment of Farmers Avenue. Oh, I see. Um, now I think what we ought to be doing, of course, is comparing this conjectural map with what we're actually finding here on the excavation. Well, it certainly seems to be that they've put this uh, drawing of the ditch far too far to the north because we've actually got it running across on this sort of area. This is this alignment of ditch That's here. That's right. Yes. And furthermore, the other ditch which we have is running almost directly across the site like this and seems to contradict the idea of having a Barbican yes, ditch Yes, you, you've there. got a very straight alignment there, which you're quite right, doesn't seem to bear any relationship to a Barbican in, in that context. So it must be something else. I wonder, actually, whether it couldn't be marking the, the boundary between the royal fee mm. of the castle and the, the borough itself over here. And as such, doesn't really line up with the line of back of the inns, Castle Street and London Street. 
Yeah, well it certainly would more, make more sense for it to be the Castle Fee. Yes, yeah, so I think we've got to chase that when we extend this area earlier next year and see if we can find well, out what's can, going on. Well we can, yes, we'll look for it then. The unravelling of the complex evidence for banks and ditches around the castle, particularly in this area of the South Bailey, was to be one of the achievements of the excavation. This turned out to be the main Bailey ditch, but it was eclipsed in depth by a later medieval ditch closer to the castle, the one they found in the first trial hole. In November 1989, both developers and archaeologists were working after dark to keep on schedule. The archaeologists were using every resource to maximise the evidence they could extract from the site, including the professional use of metal detectors. They brought in a useful haul. something there, slight signal. This could be a fish hook or a brooch pin, but it looks like a pin this bit at the end. The small pin here appears to have uh, some sort of gilding on the end, like a decorative pin. And that's what we've had, plus a bag full of nails and bone and pots that's just come out of this area. It was time to move on, down towards that other ditch discovered in the first trial hole. The deepest digging archaeologists did on the Castle Mole development site took them down into a huge ditch that once defended Norwich Castle and then filled in with rubbish over the centuries, as archaeologist Jez Reeve explains. It's very exciting here. We're standing at the bottom of the Barbican Ditch, which is about 8 metres deep and approximately 24 metres wide. Uh, one of the most interesting things about this ditch is that we've got very late fills to quite low down in the ditch. And by that I mean that we've actually got 16th century material near the bottom, which of course means that the ditch was open um, right until the 16th century. We actually think it was cut in the 13th century um, after Louis the Dauphin uh, sacked the castle in 1216 and Henry III started doing some uh, rebuilding and refortifications around that time, obviously because he was worried about the defences of the castle. This fits in very well with uh, that theory. When the whole area around the castle was eventually landscaped in the 18th century, the banks were cut off and their earth used to fill in the ditches. A stone gateway that protected the bridge to the keep was pushed over and buried in the top of the ditch. The archaeologists were able to determine that parts of this gateway were lying on their sides with their layers of flint running vertically. From the position of these pieces, near the top of the filled-in ditch, it was clear that the final demolition of the old gate had probably been done in the 17th or 18th century. The present gate of the castle is Victorian. While the archaeologists were pursuing their own investigations, the developers were hard on their heels, pile-driving the foundations of the vast underground car park and shopping centre. The Normans had used wooden spades edged with iron to dig out their deep ditches and pile the earth into tall banks. The modern developers had no such use for the earth they were shifting. It had to be lorried away from the site. This largest and deepest excavation of the archaeologists grew by the summer of 1990 into Norwich's own little Grand Canyon. In August, Brian Ayres escorted a party of the leading developers down to the bottom of the medieval ditch, where they could compare their modern commercial enterprise with the defensive work of King Henry III after the French attack in the 13th century. That's 
where it was cut back in 1220 or thereabouts. Um, and the, you've then got a primary fill, which to a certain extent is made of silt. In the hot, dry summer of 1990, the deep sections cut by the archaeologists clearly revealed the profile of the medieval ditch, filled in with the darker material as rubbish accumulated through the years. Broken pieces of pottery from all periods stuck out of the sides of the section. This piece is a German import, or local copy, from the 16th or 17th century. On a huge excavation like this, the archaeologists couldn't examine every square inch in detail. So constant sampling of the ditch material was undertaken. Not just to find human artifacts like pots, but to gain information about the environment through the centuries, from animal bones, plant remains and so on. And then the archaeologists found those Saxon houses they'd been looking for. 18 months into the excavation and we've encountered some wonderful buildings. Anglo-Saxon buildings, 11th century date, which um, were destroyed to make way for the castle. They're square structures cut into the ground, originally cut some four to five feet into the ground to make sunken featured buildings or cellared houses. What we're looking at are small huts effectively that people were living in where having cut their cellar into the ground they then revetted it with timber, horizontal timbers, the stains of which we found against the walls of the soil and held those timbers in place with vertical oak posts. These structures are very interesting. They are paralleled by other buildings in Ipswich and Thetford and York and what they're telling us along with the other evidence we have around them, is that up here we've got a very large Anglo-Saxon community. Near where we're standing, we, un we encountered graves, um, also of Saxon date, also wiped out of the way to make way for the castle. Those graves were probably associated with a small church, itself very close to two other churches. Uh, those churches indeed only a hundred yards or so from a church located 11 years ago underneath Anglia Television. And so we have the beginnings of a picture of a very extensive area of Anglo-Saxon settlement. Now if that's the case, and we do have such an extensive settlement up here on the hill, rather than just clustered around the bridgeheads down by the river, we're dealing with a very important economic and social unit 900 to 1,000 years ago. And it lays the foundation for our understanding of the development of the city through the medieval and post-medieval periods. The developers wanted an even bigger hole than the archaeologists. Those gate remains were in the way, but in the course of breaking them up, more archaeological evidence was revealed. Turned over, the gate fragments showed masonry imported from Caen in France, and even a hinge socket for the doors. The growing hole had now necessitated a temporary bailey bridge for visitors to reach the castle museum. The old approach and all the ground around it was gone. Viewed from the castle's Victorian gateway, now on a cliff edge till the completion of the development, the colossal scale of the job was apparent. All this would be filled in with underground car parking and shops and landscaped over again. From their site HQ overlooking the development, the archaeologists could start to piece together the history of the site, creating a complex computer graphic of the features they'd found in the soil. In particular, they could plot those systems of banks and ditches that once protected the castle, together with the masonry gateway that defended the keep itself, on its mound in the centre of the site. Jez Reeve. It's a very useful plot because it shows the uh, limitations of the development uh, superimposed over the archaeological features which we found, predominantly these three ditches, the Castle Free Ditch, the Bailey Ditch, and this huge one in front of the castle entrance which is called Barbican Ditch. And you can see on here that we found quite a lot of masonry um, just adjacent to the Barbican Ditch, uh, which we believe to be part of the original gatehouse. That gatehouse probably looks something like this, with side chambers to house the guard and a semicircular defensive bank and ditch of its own in front of it. 
The bridge between the gatehouse and the keep proved to rest on medieval foundations, still in place below present-day ground level. The developer's own excavation had by now removed most of the archaeological levels and sections in the main part of the site, after the archaeologists had recorded them. But even now there were telltale traces to be seen of the massive earth-moving operations of eight centuries before. The curving line of the Barbican ditch could be clearly seen in the soil adhering to the developer's piling. We can reconstruct the profile of the original ditch and its accompanying bank when they were first created in the early 13th century. An imposing defensive earthwork for the castle. In the spring of 1991, the developers held sway over the Castle Mall site. The archaeologists were only digging on the fringes now, concentrating on the interpretation of their finds rather than making many new ones. Looking down on the busy scene of development from the many storied porter cabins where their site headquarters were now located, the archaeological team was working on the mass of material that had come from this enormous excavation. Not all of it, by any means, was material derived from human activity. Archaeology relies on the environmental evidence of flora and fauna to picture the context in which human activity took place in the past. There were animal bones from all periods. This is the skeleton of a domestic cat from post-medieval times. And there were human bones from those Saxon and medieval cemeteries. Human beings have always exploited their environment to live, including the bone and horn of animals hunted or kept for the purpose. The dig turned up many objects fashioned in bone from every period of occupation, combs and spoons and pins and needles. There were coins too, dropped and lost as people went to and fro over the castle grounds, Saxon pennies and a half groat, and a coin of King Edward IV. One nice find was this bird-headed handle, perhaps part of a rod of office of the 14th century. And this is an import from Germany, a 16th century powder horn, showing a man in a German helmet of the time. There was, as usual with archaeology, a lot of pottery from the dig, including Saxon pots from before the Norman conquest. One complete, and a broken pot from Norman times, but with Saxon style of decoration. There were fine glazed stoneware imports, again from Germany in the 15th and 16th centuries, and later pieces too, including blue glazed Delftware from the Low Countries. Pottery is one of the surest means of dating the levels in which it is found. Among the more unusual finds are these horse jawbones, ordinary enough until you notice the pattern of wear on their edges, which shows that they were used as a sledge, as per a 16th century illustration. There was a particularly fine and tiny gaming dice, much smaller than a new penny piece. And the oldest piece of metalwork to come from the site was this Saxon brooch, from before the 10th century. But perhaps the most intriguing find of all, not all that old, was this 18th century pocket sundial, a sort of poor man's watch, complete with interchangeable dials for different seasons of the year, sunshine permitting. By 
early 1992, the archaeologists had moved off the development site altogether to part of the old Shire Hall beneath the castle to continue their post-excavation work. Under a large aerial photograph of their site as it would never be seen again before work began, the team pressed on with a recording and interpretation of their material. At the very end of the dig, close by the castle gateway, a well shaft had been excavated that produced the site's last intriguing finds. There were more bone pins and a copper alloy catch from a 14th century box, together with the lid of a mirror case, also in copper alloy. And in copper alloy again, a perforated skimmer, used to take the fat off the contents of the cooking pot. This one probably of 17th century date, but older drawings show the way it was used. Belts were often finished off with cast metal chapes in medieval times. This is a limestone mould for making them. And these are fragments of carved bone from the 14th century, parts of a relic box perhaps. And this the bridge of some stringed instrument. Finally, a piece of limestone, also 14th century, inscribed as a gaming board for the game of Nine Men's Morris. When Brian Ayres comes to review the course of the Castle Mall excavation, what does he say when people ask him, what have you found? We found a very great deal on this excavation. It's been quite a remarkable site for us to dig. The pre-castle town is much more extensive than we had envisaged. There are at least two extra Anglo-Saxon churches that we've discovered with their attendant graveyards. We now know that people were living as far west as Timber Hill. We found evidence for their houses on the frontage at Timber Hill, under Farmers Avenue, under Market Avenue. And then when we come to the castle itself, quite extraordinary finds, particularly in terms of the defences. Massive great earthworks constructed at the end of the 11th, beginning of the 12th century, and again in the 13th century. A ditch finally being built round about 1220 or thereabouts, some 65 feet wide and 45 feet deep, with a great defensive gateway in front of the bridge. Archaeology, of course, isn't just finding beautiful objects uh, which can be put into museum cases. Obviously we love to do that and this excavation has indeed done that. But what we also aim to do, in an equally fascinating way I feel, is to use those objects and to use the various features and deposits that we've found to interpret the way in which Norwich developed through time and more particularly the way in which the society and economy of Norwich developed in the context of the surrounding region, which after all was supplying the city with most of its raw materials. And this massive excavation, six acres of material, is enabling us to do that. We're being, we're being enabled to build up a picture of the city from a thousand years ago, right through to the post-medieval period, which means that we can look at the development of the city in a context and we can show how this part of the city developed and how what is now going on is all part of that historic process. The development is a very interesting one in its own right but it's also interesting in the fact that it's taking place here it has of course enabled us to undertake the work. It's a massive earth moving operation which has a curious analogy with what we've discovered because the construction of the castle defences in the late 11th, 12th and 13th centuries were themselves massive earth-moving constructions. And so there is a parallel, really, between what's going on now and what happened in the past. And again, I find that particularly fascinating because it links directly to what we're doing is to chart the development of the city with the work that is now going on concern future development of the city. And I think it emphasizes the past, present and future are interlinked and therein lie the contributions of archaeology to our understanding of the society within which we live.
And now that the development is almost complete, what will this area around the castle in the very centre of Norwich look like? Long after the departure of the archaeologists and when the last crane and lorry and dumper truck have left the finished shopping centre and car park, The car parking is all underground, and many of the shops are below ground level, but lit by the glass top structures that emerge from the re-landscaped surroundings of the castle. There are new buildings above ground, but much of the historic area around the castle, where the Normans cleared the Anglo-Saxons' houses and cut their deep ditches, becomes an open place again, while the modern arrangements for car parking and shopping lie deep below ground. The Normans, for all their massive earthworkings, would have been amazed, to say nothing of the Saxons in their wooden huts. Now on BBC One, look east.